Welcome to this week's Who the Folk podcast. I'm Lonnie Goldsmith, the editor of TC Jew Folk. This week, we are lucky enough to catch up with Congressman Dean Phillips. The representative of Minnesota's 3rd Congressional District was home on a brief recess, where we discussed the expectations of the job versus reality, the perpetual campaigning that comes with being an elected official, and has his mind changed at all on impeaching the president on this week's Who the Folk podcast. Congressman Dean Phillips, welcome to the Who the Folk podcast. Thank you for having us in your office here in Minnetonka. We appreciate it. Good to have you here, Lonnie. So you're about, give or take, 20% of the way through your first term. Has it been what you've expected so far? You know, Lonnie, I got to tell you, it's uh, it's been surprising in a lot of ways, uh, some disappointing ways, but more uh, remarkable ways and inspiring and hopeful ways. And uh I'll, I'll tell you that the biggest epiphany so far is how collegial uh, members are in Congress on both sides of the aisle. Uh, you know, if, if one's just watching MSNBC or Fox News or looking at Twitterdom, uh, you would think it is a unmitigated uh, social disaster in Congress. And the truth is there are thoughtful members uh, of both parties working together in bipartisan fashions and building friendships and relationships. And you got to be intentional about it. Uh, I'm one of them who is, and it's been a great blessing so far. How do you help them get beyond just what they see in their own little bubbles? Well, I both encourage them and implore and invite them to get away from the screens, whether they're on walls or in your hand, and and get back to sitting down with people. Less time tweeting, more time talking. Uh, reaching out to people who might eat dr- differently than you, pray differently than you, think differently than you, uh, live differently than you. Uh, that's how we will you know, reweave the quilt of the country and get back t- together because in a digital era, we have to actually turn to some analog, old-fashioned ways of uh, getting together or else we or else we are at risk, but, I, but I'm hopeful. And I noticed that one of the things during your campaign, at least, was the sort of the old-fashioned retail politics. You had the milk truck, you drove around, and you met people. You, you did the old mm-hmm. school, going to diners, going wherever the people were. Is that something that you think has paid off in terms of the, you know, trying to get along with people from the other side of the aisle and hearing their views on, on issues? Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, when I was a, I was brought up in a family that was, mm-hmm. you know, that, that Uh, believed in hospitality and and friendliness and good nature, uh, good natured attitudes. And when I was a young sales rep for the Phillips company, I drove around five states and sold our products. And I remember my great grandfather telling me that when you sell something, you don't use your mouth, you use your ears, you know, you you listen. And I remember those lessons. And and frankly, a lot of the stories and a lot of the people I met in, you know, in my early 20s, driving around outstate Minnesota and rural North Dakota and Nebraska, uh, are stories I remember to this day, and very much the same template that I employed in the campaign, which was listening to people. You know, this, if, if you're going to be a member of Congress, uh, it serves you well to like people and like hearing their stories. And I was also taught that if two people always agree, you only need one of them. And, and it's, I, I say that tongue-in-cheek, but it's true. I, I learn more from people who have different life experiences, have different perspectives, uh, and see things differently than me. And that is my responsibility, and it's actually what makes campaigning fun, and particularly serving in Congress uh, remarkable. So you really enjoy the campaign. Oh, I love it. It's fun. Hey, <laughs> but, but but like anything else in life, you know, yeah. you've got to make something compelling or sure. interesting or fun. In this case, campaigns have a reputation of being boring or mean-spirited or cookie-cutter. Uh, and I thought, there's a better way to do this. In fact, we inspired such a wonderful community during our campaign that they've stuck together uh, and on their own accord now in big groups are doing volunteer work in the 3rd District about once a month. A handful, 10, 20, 30 of them get together and clean up the side of a highway or go to Second Harvest Heartland and pack food uh, or, or volunteer in the community as a group of campaign volunteers. So we're trying, to, we're trying to show people that this can be not just fun but also create community. And that's what we need more of. So is the time on the job what you thought it was going to be when you were campaigning? First, it's a hard job. It's, yeah. a, it's a lot of travel. It's long hours. Mm-hmm. It's exhausting. Uh, you got to be on all the time. You got to be aware. You got to be paying attention. Uh, and the diversity of the work is extraordinary. And in many ways, it's very humbling. Uh, you recognize how much you have to learn, both in terms of parliamentary procedure, 
navigating Washington, and of course the policy issue areas that we uh, dwell on every single day. So it has been humbling. Uh, it's been inspiring. Uh, and I, in many ways, I'm a freshman in Congress, and in some ways, it's akin to feeling like a freshman in college. You're trying to find your way around. You're, it is new. And you also start recognizing how much there is to learn, and uh, I really relish that. And somebody said to me recently, uh, who they will remain nameless in the district they live in, not really important, but they've said, I hear all kinds of stuff from my rep. Flip on the TV, in the paper, there's always something. They're always saying something and I, d- I don't understand. I don't hear anything from your rep. And in the interest of full disclosure, I live in here in the third district. My answer was, well, he's a freshman and he's been guessing sort of feeling his way out. Is that sort of how you see it also? Well, the way I see it is there are workhorses in yeah. Congress and there are show horses in Congress. And okay. I prefer to be the former right okay. now. Uh, I, I do have a lot to learn. I'm keeping my head down. Uh, and I, I've been on CNN and MSNBC sure. and other networks and been in the paper sometimes. But, but there are enough people in Washington who relish that, focus on it, mm-hmm. and frankly are spending a whole lot more time talking to the national media and in many cases throwing stones via the national media yeah. and not enough time doing what I'm advocating for, which is listening, learning, building relationships, studying issues, and actually building the coalitions necessary to get work done. And I will make the argument that there is an inverse correlation between many of the people you hear from the most Mm -hmm. and those who actually can get things done ultimately in Congress. Okay. So what do you, you know, we are here in your office in Minnetonka. This is one of your monthly or so trips home, I guess as often as you can manage it with the schedule in D.C., as you're meeting with constituency, I know your schedule gets packed when you're here. What are you hearing from them in terms of what they want to see big picture and what they want to hear specifically from you? So, so what people come to me to talk about regularly uh, is not dissimilar from what they were talking about during the campaign, yeah. uh, which is starting with health care and the cost of health care. The fact that we have so many people who are one illness away from bankruptcy and who Uh, are imploring that we figure out a way to cover more people and reduce the cost of care. Uh, Young people uh, are coming to me both here and in Washington in big groups advocating for climate change uh, uh, efforts, uh, gun violence prevention Mm -hmm. legislation, Uh, by the way, which we are addressing. Uh, I I, I won't I don't, don't want to diverge too much, but we've, no. we've passed 435 bills in the House already since January 3rd, only 17 of which have actually received a vote in the Senate. Mm-hmm. And I say that because we are doing more than some might suspect, again, based on watching cable news. Uh, climate change, gun violence prevention, health care, um, uh, there's no question that in the 3rd District and in Minnesota, uh, because... Uh, for reasons you're well aware, anti-Semitism mm-hmm. has been on the minds of certain constituents. Um, uh, veterans Affairs, in fact, just last night had, held a community conversation uh, about Veterans Affairs, had uh, a wonderful turnout, about 16 people spoke. Uh, opi- opioid addiction mm-hmm. is on the radar screen, had a conversation about that. And what I ran on, Lonnie, was, uh, was reform uh, relative to campaign finance, relative to ethics reform, and voter protection, and electoral security, because there are some clear and present dangers that uh, Bob Mueller just the other day in his press conference referred to, and it is a responsibility of ours in Congress, and certainly the president, uh, to address these uh, dangerous truths that exist right now, including election security. So you mentioned, you know, some of the things you mentioned are sort of come back to the committees that you're on. You're on the House Committee on Ethics. Mm -hmm. You're on foreign affairs. Some of the caucuses you're involved with are sort of military focused. Why did you want to get involved in those areas? What spoke to you about that particular, uh, the the armed forces side of things? Well, so so uh, I ser- ethics was uh, was a committee that I was asked to join okay. uh, by Speaker Pelosi, uh, and I was on- I'm honored to serve on it. It's interesting because it's one of the few committees in which there are an equal number of Democrats and Republicans, five of each. Uh, and it's also a closed committee, meaning that we have no staff or, or the public because of what we deal with, which mm-hmm. is uh, House ethics. Uh, I had advocated to join the Foreign Affairs Committee because I think that we should be focused a lot more on diplomacy uh, and our State Department and using our national resources uh, to pursue our national interests. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, in my estimation, our foreign assistance budget assistance budget right now uh, is not used uh, in the way that I think it can and should, mm-hmm. uh, in ways that will build economic opportunity for people around the world, and most of all, um, enhance our safety and security in this country. Uh, so uh, that is a focus of mine. And financial services uh, was a committee that uh, leadership asked me to to uh, join because of my experience in business and uh, understanding the banking system and insurance mm-hmm. and housing and whatnot. And uh, there, but it's a lot of meaty stuff. Yeah. And no matter how much experience one brings to Congress, rest assured, uh, they have a lot more to learn, and I'm just one of them. Yeah. So you had mentioned um, Bob Mueller in terms of election security, and obviously uh, HR one, so the you know, first bill out of the shoot, was about election security and ethics and reform. That kind of things that you spoke to throughout the campaign trail. But obviously, with the conclusion of Robert Mueller's investigation Mm -hmm. and his statements recently, how has what he said impacted how you think the House should proceed in terms of holding the president accountable? Well, the report, for those who've read the report, uh, while it doesn't uh, call for impeachment or, or Uh, prosecution, if you will. Uh, I think Mr. Mueller made it clear why it didn't Mm -hmm. in his press conference the other day. Uh, He laid out, in in my estimation, some some very compelling uh, facts that that, uh, we cannot dismiss. Uh, And in my estimation, um, what has changed uh, are two things, Uh, one of which is that he was so clear in his recent press conference that what the country should be focused on more than anything is meddling in our elections. It happened in 2016. It's going to happen again in 2020. And as he said, every American should be mindful of it. Uh, What he didn't answer uh, was how we should proceed, and that is because that's how the Constitution prescribes it. Uh, We are afforded a mechanism uh, to uh, remove a president if we feel necessary. We're not compelled to do so. Uh, And in my estimation, uh, we have more to learn. And and the report that uh, that we have read is redacted. Uh, I call attention to the 12 of the 14 cases referred to in the report uh, that were sent to other agencies because they were outside the jurisdiction or the purview of this uh, specific investigation. But those have all been redacted. We don't know what they are yet. Uh, So on the subject of impeachment and how to proceed, in my estimation, like most Democrats still, I believe we should continue down the the legal paths that we have available to us, Uh, uh, have documents produced uh, that we can uh, read and, and better understand, solicit testimony from people who have not yet appeared, mm-hmm. uh, and in my estimation, most importantly, identify which of those 12 cases that were referred out of the Mueller investigation, uh, if any of those um, have evidence of criminal activity. And if so, uh, we have a responsibility to act because we have a, a oath to our Constitution, not to a party. And I think one of the take personally, I think one of the takeaways from Bob <clears throat> Mueller's statement was that it is the responsibility of the Congress. Mm-hmm. It's the Constitution says the you know to start an impeachment inquiry is within the remit mm-hmm. of, of the House and not the special prosecutor. And that's yeah, and that's that's clear, mm-hmm. and uh, that's the tool available to us. And, and, and in my estimate, and by the way, uh, you know I'm not I'm not opposed to impeachment. I'm not okay. a no on impeachment, uh, but I'm very much clear in that I believe we have more work to do to ascertain uh, if indeed it's warranted. Uh, and also, most importantly, put the entire country's best interests first. Right. And uh, it's that re- it's it's that issue uh, that we should all be mindful of. And I, you know, we've been we've been methodical, we've been principled, uh, and we've been patient. Mm-hmm. But our patience is wearing thin. There's no question. And uh, we have a responsibility to learn more uh, and do what I believe is in the country's best interest. And we'll be having those conversations, certainly a lot more of them over the coming days. So, had you been back in the district when Bob Mueller gave his? Statement? Or were you still in D.C.? I was traveling when he gave his statement, okay. but I watched it. Okay. Yeah, I watched no, it. No, ter- I just wasn't sure if you yeah. – I asked because I wasn't sure if, you know, a majority at least of the Democratic caucus was around or at least together to no, we had have a, a conversation about what had what had taken place. No, we had dispersed, but as you can imagine, Twitter is in some, you know, strange and sometimes – positive ways and sometimes not so positive ways kind of serves as a little bit of that community right. uh, where you keep tabs on your sure. your friends and neighbors in this case colleagues and yeah. see what they're saying and and um, and that and that and that that can be helpful but it can also be uh, destructive because we should all be thinking about this uh, from our personal perspectives and with our own principles so not that I mean 
trying to get you to you know think about other offices, but obviously with your Minnesota colleague Senator Klobuchar running for president, and you know she announced in the middle of a blizzard, mm-hmm. and she was hardly first. So this is it feels like the 2020 presidential campaign started right after. Mm-hmm. Um, was certainly well before you were sworn in in 2019, uh, probably shortly after Election Day it started. Um, yeah, is that after, too s- after Election Day 2016. <laughs> Bad, too. Is that too soon? Like, has the has the cycle just gotten too sped up, do you think? People ask me that question regularly, and, and I will. I tell them the same thing I'll tell you, which is, in my estimation, we'd have a healthier uh, political discourse and um, c- country if our election windows were shorter. Mm -hmm. Uh, Many countries very much limit how long campaign season is. They limit um, television advertising. Uh, They provide equal airtime to every candidate. You know, there are some best practices that I believe we should at least consider and and investigate because, yes, campaigning is constant. uh, And corresponding with campaigning is the relentless raising of money, the pursuit of money, which, as you know, is uh, because I talk about it all the time, is I think the most destructive and threatening um, issue that we have to deal with in this country. So I'd like to see shorter campaign windows, particularly as as you recognize, a lot of people serving the public right now in the Senate, in the House, and mm-hmm. other positions are now spending a lot of their time running around the country doing anything but the job that they're charged with doing. And um, that's not to say that you can't be a senator and run for president. Sure. I think, it's, in fact, I think it's a terrific stepping stone to doing so. But to do so for so many months. Right. Uh, is something that uh, I struggle with. Did you know that basically from the time you got sworn in, you were going to start campaigning? That you like you were going to have that you you always sort of have to keep one eye on two years from then. You know, I'll, t- I'll say that when when I first started running, the notion of doing this every two years uh, it was something I struggled with. Yeah, and I thought, boy, maybe we should look at you know making it four year terms or, or something. And then I, I'll tell you when I was sworn into Congress and I've um, born witness to uh, the inner workings and the dynamics that we face right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm glad that we have two-year cycles because it is the mechanism by which the American public uh, can register its either approval or disapproval uh, in the middle of a four-year presidential term. I think our founders had uh, designed this system remarkably well yeah. and attuned to possibilities and threats. And it's frustrating sometimes, but it's also, I think, a very important element of our democratic republic. Although, in so many ways, obviously, it changed, you know, the, the, the nature of democracy, I think, has changed pretty significantly, and the, the tools of democracy, and the, certainly technology, oh, that is used now in ways that, obviously, I don't think the founders could have even comprehended. No, they couldn't have comprehend television. They couldn't comprehend yes. the amount of money being used to influence people. They couldn't comprehend social media. They couldn't comprehend weapons that, when one pulls a trigger... Uh, you know, hundreds of people can be killed in the matter of moments. They couldn't comprehend any of these things, right. uh, as with even with their remarkable foresight, uh, which is the perpetual tug of war we will always face in this country about their intent, uh, about how the Constitution you know, intersects with the issues of the day, uh, and that's why we need thoughtful people from all different perspectives and backgrounds around the country willing to debate those issues in in thoughtful ways, you know, and and perhaps disagree without being disagreeable, uh, because there's no way our founders could have imagined some of the issues we face. But thank goodness for them, because we do have the foundation uh, and the mechanisms by which uh, all of these issues can be overcome with the right people populating the system. And I'll say that, in my estimation, we don't have a hardware problem. If anything, we have a software problem. We have to send the right people to make sure the institution functions in the right way. So in terms of, you know, we talked about the constituency, you know, thinking of the individual citizens, but also cities, you know, there are a lot of cities in this district that you represent. And obviously, you know, working with the, you know, I would imagine with Governor Walls and his administration in terms of what the state's needs are, how can you help sort of bridge um, those needs uh, that they that may have uh, locally with what you can do in D.C. for them? So I, I, I believe representation begins with listening. Mm-hmm. And to that end, I just completed a 36-city tour of the entire district, visited with mayors, city council members, city administrators in every township, village, and city in the district, uh, and listened. Asked them, what you know, what are your priorities? What are the issues your community is facing? And it won't surprise you that infrastructure needs. I mean, at the top of just about every city's list. 
So I aggregate what I learn and listen to. My staff joins me. Uh, uh, they have conversations every week with um, uh, with people throughout the district. Uh, and that's how we aggregate and then elevate the issues that I advocate for in both Washington. And then increasingly, we'll be collaborating with uh, local and state officials uh, to try to encourage thoughtful policy. You know, there, there are areas in which the federal government can and should be helpful. There are also issues that I think are best left to local governments and state governments. Uh, but I'll tell you, at the end of the day, uh, we have an infrastructure challenge in this country that is real. Uh, every community is facing. It's not a red issue or a blue issue. It is a totally American issue. And I'm sure my colleagues throughout districts in the entire country are hearing the same thing. And that's how, we, that's how representation should be practiced. And, um, and I look forward to doing a lot more of it. Good. Infrastructure, it's not sexy. It's, you know, roads and bridges. That's not flashy stuff. But it affects commerce. It affects people getting to work. Like there, it, it affects the everyday things that people need to do to get by. So how can, I mean, I know it's sort of a, a joke on Twitter about, oh, this week is Infrastructure Week. Mm-hmm. And it's been going on for years, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. But it looked like maybe something was going to happen mm-hmm. with infrastructure. And now suddenly, you know, all of a sudden, it's not. H- how can people on the other side of the aisle, how do you help them? How do, how do you have the discussion with them about how important it is, not just to your district, but probably to theirs, too? Well, it's analogous to the roof on a, on a home, and nobody likes to come to the recognition that I've got to replace my roof. Nobody can see it. It's expensive. You know, but if you don't do it, you, know, you can't even sleep at night because uh, you know, it's going to rain on you. Yes. Uh, and this is the same issue we have with infrastructure in this country. You know, some of it may not be uh, the attractive, innovative uh, projects that will redefine how a community looks, but it is the foundation through which we live our daily lives as individuals. It's the foundation of commerce in our country. It's the foundation of national security. The interstate highway system yeah. was initiated uh, as a national defense strategy, and some people don't recall that. Uh, and by the way, it's not just roads and bridges. It's it's uh, the electric grid and oh, transmission. Yeah. It's it's broadband. Uh, it's water and and sewer. And it is comprehensive. And it, we we are also a nation that is uh, in some ways a teenager uh, amongst adults. Yeah. You know, our, we are uh, a nation that is a little over you know two and a half centuries old, and compared to some of our peers that have been. <laughs> You know, that have literally generations and generations of inter- infrastructure right. underneath them. And that's hard to come to grips with. But I, the other epiphany is that Democrats and Republicans all agree and recognize what we have to do. There's not a lot of debate about what we need to do. The debate is how you pay for it. Yeah. And, you know, we, we find the resources to go to war. Mm-hmm. We find hundreds of billions of dollars a year to defend our country. Uh, and we should be able to deploy... <clears throat> adequate resources uh, to ensure the foundation of the country is secure, and uh, there are ways to do so, and, and we're working on them right now. And I would argue personally that uh, I'm a proponent of carbon fee and dividend, which is putting a price on carbon, mm-hmm. returning the proceeds to taxpayers. Uh, it provides an incentive to start migrating to clean energy and a disincentive to continue carbon-based fuels. Uh, I'm a proponent of potentially enhancing that so that uh, we create a national infrastructure bank of resources derived from pricing carbon. Uh, and it is more broad-based than just a gas tax, uh, and it's comprehensive, and it also will allow us to actually address climate change and our infrastructure needs. So I've, I, I'm advocating for that. I've shared that with the White House and with others in Congress, and uh, we'll see where it goes. Well, best of luck on that uh... Well, thank In you. In that regard, certainly. All right, last couple questions, and I'll let you get to your next uh, constituent meeting here. Uh, your favorite Jewish food? Oh, my favorite Jewish food? Well, I tell you, I just won uh, at the March of Dimes uh, uh, cook-off okay. in Washington, D.C., uh, the People's Choice Award yeah. for my latkes. Ah, very good. And I had to educate hundreds of people who came to my booth uh, that the latke must be served with sour cream and applesauce. Okay. So I, I'm partial to the handmade latke with a little bit of potato skin in it. Okay. I like. The, yeah, you gotta yeah. have the skin on yeah. it. Yeah. I agree. And and I like. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So let's leave it at that. Okay. So yeah. what makes them? So, what makes yours so special, though? Well, crispy. Yeah. Potato skin. Yeah. Uh, is is kind of that's how I like a little crispy on the outside okay. but a little bit softer on the inside okay and and really good applesauce yeah that's yeah you're making me hungry Lonnie I'm 
making me hungry too. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, and no, I don't like raisins in my challah. I don't either. Yeah, Excellent. I don't. In fact, I don't think any baked good should. And this is, I know my raisin growing friends in California won't like this, but I, I think raisins are best left outside of baked goods. Well, the good news is they're, you don't have to worry about them voting for you anyway. So, <laughs> exactly. Unless you start running yeah. for, you know, nas- yeah. a national office. And I like friends. my Kugel savory, not sweet. Okay. Yeah. Ditto. All right. Not that you asked, of No, course. I didn't. But listen, <laughs> I'm happy to talk Jewish food all day. And uh, favorite Jewish holiday? Favorite Jewish holiday uh, is Pesach. Okay. And uh, you know, I, first of all, it, it is so um, it so represents what I love, which yeah. is coming together at the table together, uh, and I love that it's a tradition that has been practiced for you know thousands of years, yeah. and uh, with the same foods and the same traditions uh, and the same storytelling, and and that's powerful. And I think it's traditions that have the potential actually to keep um, all of us together, uh, not just the Jewish community, mm-hmm. but uh, the American community, uh, which is. You know, why Thanksgiving is such an important holiday to treasure in this country as well, because we need to spend more time at the table together, a little more time talking and a little less time tweeting. Well, Congressman Dean Phillips, it has uh, been a, our pleasure to sit with you. Thank you so much for joining us this week. We appreciate it. Thanks, Lonnie. Keep the faith. Optimism is just as contagious as fear. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Thank you. Hey, thanks for having me. Thanks so much to Congressman Phillips for joining us this week. If you haven't yet, please subscribe to the podcast. You can find us on Apple Podcast, Google Podcast, Spotify, and more. If you have suggestions of who we should have on the show in the future, please let me know. You can get me at editor at tcjufolk.com. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next week.